ready to start again. We ended up talking about liturgical context, and I suggested to you that that context is actually defined by the scriptures that are read. So I wonder if we could start by hearing some words of God that we read on the Feast of St. Stephen, the proto-martyr. And so I want somebody with a Bible there to look up 2 Chronicles 24. 2 Chronicles 24, 17 to 22. 2 Chronicles 24, 17 to 22. Who's got it? I think it's in the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles 24, 17 to 22. Okay, wait, read it louder. <laughs> but after the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and bowed down to the king, and the king whispers to them. They abandoned the house of, of the Lord, Yahweh, the God of their fathers, and served the Asherim and the idols. So wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their guilt. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to Yahweh, though they testified against them. They would not listen to them. Then the Spirit of God came upon uh, Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, and he stood above the people and said to them, Thus God has said, Why do you transgress the commandments of Yahweh and do not prosper? Because you have forsaken Yahweh, he also has forsaken you. So they conspired against him, and at the command of the king, they stoned him to death in the court of the house of Yahweh. Thus Josh, Joash, the king, did not remember the kindness which his father Jehoiada had shown him, but he murdered his son, and as he did, he said, May Yahweh see and avenge. As he died, he said, May, may Yahweh see and avenge. This is the word of the Lord. May Yahweh see it and avenge. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then... The epistle reading from Acts 6, we're only going to pick up the tail end. Acts 6, verses 51 to 60. Who's got that? Acts 6, 51 to 60. You men who are stiff and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears, and they rushed upon him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Yahweh, see it in avenge. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. What about the gospel reading for the day? Matthew 23, 34. To 39. Who's got that? Matthew 23, 34 to 39. Anyone? I feel like I'm in Ferris Bueller. Anyone? Anyone? Jesus said, Therefore I send you prophets, <coughs> wise men, and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify. Some you will flog in your synagogue and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, 
who knew murder between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. How far did you say? Through 39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So as you listen to these readings, if you're in the pew, hearing them, what's your immediate question? Is it a different God in the Old Testament? How can you have it both ways? How can you have it both ways? I'm going to offer you how I handled this particular set of readings. The sermon began. You can't help but notice the difference. At the end of the first reading, Zechariah's dying words. Yahweh, look on it and avenge. And at the end of the second reading, Stephen's dying words. Lord, do not lay this sin to their charge. Zechariah's words we understand. Because do not all the horrid crimes of injustice cry out to heaven for redress? We remember the words of the Lord to Cain. What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And the blood of how many brothers and sisters has been mingled with Abel's blood to stain the earth since then, all pleading to God for justice. So then what are we to make of St. Stephen's final words? A man who simply spoke the truth to his hearers they didn't want to listen to, and as a result, he was judged unworthy of life, death by stoning, under the reign of rock, tearing his flesh, crushing his bones. He prayed and commended his spirit to the Lord Jesus. His final words, begging absolution for those who were murdering him. How does one get from Zechariah's, go get him, God, to Stephen's pardon them, God. What intervenes? Well, we should, of course, ask it differently. Who intervenes? The one who speaks in today's gospel reading. That's who. The Lord Jesus himself, who made no bones about the fact that those he sends to speak his words will not be welcomed or honored. They will be ridiculed, and some will be killed. Some will be crucified, some will be beaten, some will be chased from one town to the other. So it happens, says Jesus, that all the blood from Abel down to Zechariah comes on you. Given such a prediction, you'd have expected his next words to be words of woe yeah. and of warning. Yeah. Instead, they are words that break open the deep recesses of God's heart for all to see the mercy that beats there. <coughs> oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I've wanted to gather your children together. Like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. That's the God revealed in Jesus. The God who does not like to take the sinners, go away and leave me alone, as the final word. Who always hopes for repentance and in mercy keeps trying to speak to his people. The word that'll shake them up, turn them from their sins, bring them home to him. This is the God who in the holy city of Jerusalem got hold of him handed him over to the Romans, took him outside the city gate, nailed his arms and legs to the wood of the cross, and it was as he was being nailed that he prayed it. The words that changed everything. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive, 
he could pray that. He knew what it was to suffer unjustly, betrayed by a friend, abandoned in his pain, ridiculed, mocked, scourged, pummeled. It was his blood, which is truly the blood of God, for he is the word made flesh, as we celebrate it yesterday, liturgical context. As his blood touched the earth, that everything changed. Because here was blood that did not cry for red vengeance and retribution. Here's blood that cries out for mercy and pardon, unconquered by the hatred it received. And it conquered hatred with love, with each drop running down the cross, staining the earth, smearing the face of his holy mother as she kissed his feet and poured from his side with the water as the spear ran through, with each drop the cry was heard in heaven louder and louder. Father, forgive. Father, forgive. Father, forgive. And so all the blood of the righteous, dead, and all the world met together upon that generation. For all their cries of vengeance were heard and answered in a way that none of them could have anticipated. The blood of Jesus winning pardon did more than achieve forgiveness of sins. It positively destroyed the power of death itself. His own resurrection was the sign from God that death has been destroyed for all who trust that blood of Jesus to wipe away their sins. And if we remember that, we can perhaps see why Zechariah, who did not yet know the power of Jesus' blood to forgive sins and overcome death, could pray as he lay dying, Lord, please don't forget me. Please don't forget the injustice I've suffered for your sake. The blood of Jesus is God's answer to Zechariah's prayer. Man, I have not forgotten you. Instead, I came to share your fate, to raise you from the dead. Stephen, who knew the power of Jesus' blood, he knew precisely what that blood meant. He could meet his death without any desire for revenge and without fear that he would be forgotten. He knew that he would, was remembered. He'd seen the Lord standing to greet him. He knew that his sins were covered by the blood of God in the flesh and that his Lord and Master lived again on the other side of death and would call him out of death into eternal life. He saw his Lord stand up to bid him come home and welcome him to his embrace. Why cry for vengeance? Rather, joining his martyr's blood to the Lord's, he cries for pardon. And who knows if it was not precisely that prayer of Saul or that saved Saul, who was there consenting to Stephen's death and thus became Paul, the great apostle. So you people might be thinking, the day after Christmas, rather a bloody homily and subject for Christmas. I'll banish the thought. You still live in a world where atrocities of injustice happen with alarming and increasing regularity. You still live in a world where the innocent are slain. How good to remember that it was to win forgiveness for all sins that brings sadness into this world that the Lord was born. How beautiful to remember that the eternal word became a fetus and was born of Mary so that he might become firstborn from the dead and destroy the might of the devil himself, fling wide open the gates of the kingdom. In the blood of St. Stephen's day, the church remembers why we desperately need this child and the life that's found in his blood, blood that he still bids you receive at his altar, blood that still cries for your pardon and promises you an unending life, blood that will enable you to join St. Stephen in praying that God would bless and forgive your enemies. Amen. I'm sorry to inflict a sermon, but I want to see a way of preaching that literally begins with the liturgical context. You got this crazy bunch of people that have gathered to hear the words of this book. <laughs> this book has been gathering people together to hear it for a very, very long time. 
And as they hear the words, the questions that those words pose in their minds surely form a very natural starting point for any homily that you preach, right? I know, I should say I know, I, I suspect that at seminary, the way homiletics is usually taught is you've got to show them that you get their world before they're interested in hearing how the Bible's passages apply to them. I really think, and it, it, that sometimes works, it, it really does, but I do think that most of the time you don't need to go there because the Bible is written in your world. The, the, the world that you just heard described in the readings that were read, that's not our world. That is our world, where injustice is everywhere. And yet, where in the midst of all this mess, God planted life in his son's blood. That's the world. And when you start with where the readings for the day start, you're inviting the people to see this world with the eyes of God. And I think that for the, when you do that, you immediately have their attention and their interest. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Comment? Uh, strange way to say it, but I would say the, the fourth reading was preached by the lives and the forgiveness of the people in Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, when those people were massacred. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that story, right? They never know what to do with that story. But that is the story, right? Yeah, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Now, I want to invite you not just to think about how you begin your sermons, but where your sermon fits in the liturgical context of the, the divine service itself. Think about this. We heard in the, the, uh, the, the passage in Acts yesterday from, Joel, uh, from Acts 2, the passage from Joel. Your sons and your daughters were prophesied. Are those just throwaway words? Or do they come to fruition among us? I would propose to you that they come to glorious fruition in our Lutheran church, precisely in the church's song. This is how the royal priesthood of the baptized exercises itself in the proclamation of the word. In other words, in any divine service, you are not the only preacher. The people of God have assembled there to preach to each other. And they do this in the words of the songs. Now, I always get in trouble when I pick on this song, but I'm sorry. I love to tell the story, but I'll never get around to doing it because I'll just keep on talking about how I love to tell the story. All right. The Lutherans have a song that actually tells the story. It's actually the hymn of the day for Cantate um, in the one-year series. Uh, Luther's great Reformation hymn, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. How many of you use that hymn in your church? Some of you, okay. Why is it that people think, oh, we can't use that? <laughs> Say it again. Too many stanzas. Ten long stanzas. Our organist is Roman Catholic. <laughs> he shakes his head and says, don't you ever get tired of these ridiculously long hymns? And we're like, no. Nope. Um, but, 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 but. I think the key is we need to let the hymns work in such a way that they actually preach. So hear it. All sing the first verse, first stanza. I say verse and John Vigor yells at me. Uh, it's the first stanza. Um, hear it. Dear Christians, one and all rejoice with exultation springing. What does springing mean? 
jumping up and down for joy. People say, oh, you know, you Lutherans and your sad, horrible music, and you want to say, the Christians one and all rejoice with exaltation spring, and with united heart and voice and holy emotion. I thought Lutherans didn't do the emotion thing. Holy rapture singing. Proclaim the wonders God has done. How his right arm the victory won. What price our ransom cost him. Then don't ask everybody to sing the next stanza. Instead, you might say, men, sing these words. And everybody else listens. The women listen. The children listen. Fast bound in Satan's chains I lay. Death brooded darkly o'er me. Sin was my torment night and day, and sin my mother bore me. But daily, deeper, still I fell. My life became a living hell. So firmly sin possessed me. Then tell the men to shut up and listen. And have the women proclaim, My own good works all came to nothing, naught. No grace or merit gaining. Free will against God's judgment fought dead to all good remaining. My fears increased till sheer despair left only death to be my, my share. The pangs of hell I suffered. And then take a child and have them sing. But God had seen my wretched state before the world's foundation. And mindful of his mercy great, he planned for my salvation. He turned to me a father's heart. He did not choose the easy part, but gave his dearest treasure. Then have the men sing. God said to his beloved son, it's time to have compassion. Then go, bright jewel of my crown, and bring to all salvation. From sin and sorrow, set them free. Slay bitter death for them, that they may live with you forever. Then tell the men to shut up and have the women sing. The son obeyed his father's will, was born a virgin mother. In God's good pleasure to fulfill, he came to be my brother. His royal power disguised he bore, a servant's form like mine he wore to lead the devil captive. We could keep on going, but you're getting the point, right? There's a word that Walter uses for this. Anybody know what it is? Wechselsingen, which means best translated, back and forth singing. If you want to be snotty, you say antiphonal singing. Um, but, but, you know, back and forth. But, 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 but the whole point is to actually have the assembly participate in proclaiming and in listening. And what's in the hymns is there to preach for the day. What's in the readings? So, think about Christmas Eve. Hymn of the day. Von Himmel hoch. Komm ich her. Fifteen stanzas worth. Well, now you know how to do it. Don't ask your congregation to sing it straight through. They'll be exhausted and they won't be able to actually listen or really preach it. But when you divide it up and teach them what they're doing, that they're preaching, and they're listening to the preaching, which the priesthood of the baptized is now doing in this assembly, all comes good. Now, I have one comment that relates to this with Divine Service 5. I'm curious. Anyone in this room done Divine Service 5? Not many of you. Those of you who have, I hope that you did not have the people carry the entire load of the music all together, all the way through. Because if you did, you have had your people say to you, Pastor, do we have to do that again? It's exhausting, but the music itself wasn't meant to work that way. Let me give you an example. Kyrie, Kyrie Godfather. Imagine this Kyrie, give it to the choir or the cantors. Have three voices, just three, you don't need many. 
have the three sing in, in harmony the, the opening, Kyrie. Then they, they're quiet, and it's, one of the voices goes out. God, Father in heaven above, you abound in gracious love of all things, the maker and preserver. Then back in harmony. Eleison, eleison. The people actually are listening to the Kyrie this way and praying it with them, the words in front of them, but they're actually hearing it be prayed. Um, when they're done with the Kyrie, and this, I mean, you do the same thing for each of the, each of the stances. When you're done with that, you move to the Gloria, and now they're really, after hearing that Kyrie, they're ready to, to let rip some, some glorious praise. But even here, <coughs> the way Luther wrote the music suggests that you should sing it like this. Maybe the men. All glory be to God alone. The women. Forevermore the highest one. Maybe the choir. Who did our sinful race befriend. Maybe everybody together. And grace and peace to us extend. The men. Among us may his gracious will. Women. All hearts with deep thanksgiving fill. They're going to come to the end of all of those stanzas of the Gloria, and they're not going to be wiped out. They're going to, I would propose, be actually energized. And I would like to point out that this is really the way Isaiah was written to work too. Some of the descriptions of how Isaiah was done in the church orders is fascinating. Remember, in Luther's order, this follows the consecration, right? Right? So picture two boys, choir boys, one on one side, one on the other, and the first one starts his singing. I say a mighty seer in days of old. The second one answers. The Lord of all in spirit did behold. Back to the other side. Um, all the way through, high on a lofty throne in splendor bright. And then when you get to the Sanctus, what do you do? When you get to the oh, oh then all of a sudden, you're going to have Everybody joining in. You're hopefully going to have the organ. If you have the timpani, now's the time to use them. The trumpets, everything. Holy is God, the Lord of Sabbath. I mean, let it rip. This is the point at which Luther says we needed to keep this because this goes so well with the elevation. If you're going to, if you're going to have the elevation, this is the time to do it. Um, and then back to real quiet at the end. The beams. The, I can't remember the music. The beams and lintels trembled at the choir at the cry on the other side. And clouds of smoke and wrap, and clouds of smoke and wrap the throne on high. This, this makes this service actually work. I, I wish we'd have been able to to print more of it out like that. Um, I have a dream that we're going to do something like that for our worship conference advertisement, 2017 going to be at Concordia University, Chicago. So not too far from any of you guys. And it's going to be a reformation. This is the, this is the um, Institute on Liturgy, Preaching, and Church Music. It's going to be focused on a reformation theme of Habakkuk. Dr. Gard is actually going to give us the three chapters of Habakkuk, one, one a day, as we work our way through. Because this is the joy that sets the people of God to singing. Um, the joy that, remember, Habakkuk has, has to finally end with. The theme, the theme, I'm going to get the words exactly right. The just live by faith. Make it plain in sermon, service, song. So Habakkuk ends with the great hymn of praise at the end of the book. Dr. Just? <laughs> I don't know. You should ask him, hopefully. Um, the, uh, the just live by faith. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> if I promise him that we'll do Luke instead of uh, Habakkuk, he probably would be. Um, the, 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 the thing I'm pleading with you with, though, here is that in your preaching, don't just think of your sermon. In your preaching, think of the entirety of the hymns and the attendant music, and let these preach. 
This is what Bach argued for when he argued for a, uh, a, well, uh, a well-organized, well-constructed church music, that, that there would be a set of great music that goes with the readings of the day, preaching them the same way. Um, this means that part of your sermon preparation is you have to sit down and talk to your choir director. Now, some of you may be blessed to have a choir director who gets that they're, they're helping the choir preach the word that day. Blessed are you. Make them happy. Buy them champagne. Take care of them. They are rare. More of our people just have never been taught. And so the choir director thinks that their job is to produce anthems that may or may not have any connections to, to a given day. It really does blow their minds when you say, no, I need you to help me preach today. I need you to help me. Look, here, these are the, these are the readings. How can we, how can, do you know, what music do you know that proclaims this, that helps preach this to the people? It transforms the worship service. When from start to finish, the context is all proclaiming the same message that's in the readings. In addition to what you find in, in, in the, well, let me step back for a second. I, I mentioned this earlier, I, I think to Dr. Stuck, which makes me so sad that we have so many treasures that have still been locked up um, auf Deutsch. Uh, if you've not explored and found some of the music, especially Schütz. Schütz, Schütz, do you know anything of the story of Schütz? This is an amazing story. The prince happened to be going through the territory and stopped at an inn, and there was a kid there who sang, and sang well. And the prince said, I'm taking him, I want him. And the parents were like, no you're not, he's gonna be raised here and run this inn. And the prince was very persistent. Finally, the parents said, all right, you can have him. The prince sent him off down to, to Italy, learned the best of what's going on with music. He came back. He had an incredibly long tenure during the Thirty Years' War. There were times he had to make music with five musicians. There were times he had three. There were times he had 50. There were times he had full orchestras and times he had nothing. And he wrote music for all of that. You stop and think about the situation or so many of our parishes. There are parishes that have everything. Most of our parishes don't. Most of our parishes have music that struggles. Schutz, he's got the music. And it was all designed around proclaiming the readings. I mean, half the time he actually just set the readings to music. Have you guys ever heard his Christmas, his Christmas Vespers? I mean, I, I'm telling you, you if, how many of you do, do German? Enough German to recognize the Bible when you hear it. If you can just recognize the Bible when you hear it, and you listen to Schitt's Christmas Vespers, he gets to literally, after the, after the it's, he starts out with the Latin, um, Oh Lord, oh, uh, 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 make haste to God to deliver me. Um, and then he goes to a psalm. He has a very creative way of setting the psalms. The psalm, uh, the psalm is very raucous, psalm two. Very raucous by the way he, uh, he, he introduces it. Uh, and then, then he comes to uh, the hymn of the day uh, and, and, and then he moves to the readings. And for the readings, he basically just tells the entire story of Christmas through Epiphany, literally word for word out of the scripture. But he sets it all to music. And he does such interesting things. Whenever you get to Mary and Mary, you get this. Und Maria, die Jungfrau. I mean, the, you, you, you have this, this he, he, he gets real soft and beautiful. He, everything is painted. The music paints, and it paints a picture. And by the time he's done, it, it's the most beautiful telling of the story. 
Um, this was at a time when he had big resources in it, so it's, it's, it's big, loud, and beautiful. You can find it on your, uh, at your iTunes store. It's, it's, uh, it's Christmas, Christmas Vespers by Heinrich Schitz. And it, it's, if you like the Pretorius Mass for Christmas Day, this is even, even more stunning. Back to things that are more practical maybe for our church. Think about CPH's Concertato series. Do you guys know what I mean by that? So you have the hymn of the day. Why shouldn't the people get to also hear something special in the hymn of the day? So if you've not heard like what they, the Concertato series does for a wondrous type, oh, that is a beautiful, beautiful setting. And the choir has its own verse on a wondrous type. And uh, you know, CPH can be, you know, sometimes it's a little um, formulaic that you know, there's gonna be the choir verse and then the last verse is gonna have the soprano death can. <laughs> you can count on it. But it, it, at the same time, that is actually rather effective and, and beautiful. What about, it, uh, like for Advent 2, um, in, in, again, I'm gonna go back to the one year which I'm more familiar with, uh, the Populizion. Um, here it's the return of Christ in glory. The hymn of the day is? Lo, he comes. Lo, he comes. And CPH has a stunning setting of that. So you put the, you know, let the music preach. The choir primarily as proclaimers. The people, the royal priesthood proclaiming. And one last item for liturgical context, which is also an advertisement. My office prepares and sends out, and some of you have helped write, Let Us Pray. We provide Let Us Pray, which is the prayer of the church, for the one-year series or the three-year series. And the prayers actually reflect the readings of the day, sometimes more, sometimes less, but they generally are, they take their keynote from the reading of the day, the liturgical context, and uh, they can be a, a huge resource, which, is not to say I advocate dumping the general prayer. The general prayers are also by themselves, the ones in the hymnal, are stunning and beautiful, and I wish they had more common use among us. We got to hear one yesterday, and my heart was, was glad. Um, all right. D does all of that make sense? That when you're thinking about sermon and preaching, you're thinking about how do I proclaim this word not just in my homily, but how does this open up to praise and proclamation in the assembly, in the congregation? It's at the very heart of all preaching. What Dr. Stuckwish said, it moves to the altar, um, and it does, but I think it moves along the path of praise to the altar. In other words, there's something in the preaching that when you've done, when you're finished your sermon and somebody comes up and says, man, that was a good sermon, you know you failed. <laughs> How do you know it was a good sermon? When they come up and say, man, what a great God! He did that for us? Wow! Then you've had a sermon that did what a sermon is to do. It moved them to praise and to the altar where there's even more gifts waiting. All right. Um, comments, questions, thoughts on, on, on that? Anything from you guys? Sing a hymn. Sing a hymn. I wish we had our hymnals here. Um, if not, I'm going to shift into uh, a thought about what I call the long view. When you come, when you were at seminary, how do they teach you? What's the first step of preparing a sermon? Maybe, I found that a lot of the younger pastors, this is not what they were told. So I found it interesting that they told us this. Does the word establish the text mean anything to you? What does establish the text mean? It doesn't mean decide what you're going to preach on. It means pretend you're smart as Bruce Metzger and can sort your way through the apparatus and find out on the best of your judgment exactly what the original text is. 
which I think at the very beginning plants an awful lot of doubt because none of you in this room, certainly not me, we're not Bruce Metzger's. It's a very different approach when we say the spirit who inspires the texts preserves in the church the texts. And so you, you take what you are handed and you begin preaching it. But as you do, you recognize you're not the first. I earlier mentioned Justin. Listen again to his description of what happens. A.D. 150, he's, he's about when he's martyred. So, what? Less than 50 years after the death of John. On the day called after the sun, all who are in the towns and in the country assemble epi ta alta, which should ring from 1 Corinthians 11. When you come together epi ta alta in one place. And the writings of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read for as long as time permits. And when the reader is finished, the preacher, the president, gives a speech. Notice that the reader was not the same thing as the president. The president gives a speech inviting us into the pattern of these beautiful things. And then we all stand up together and we make our prayers. Let me stop there. Do you guys remember how the prayers actually ran in the ancient church? We've truncated this so unbelievably. How did they run? We are, the last remnant we have of it is on Good Friday. And even our book only gives you the little remnant. I mean, picture the thing. There stands up the, the deacon and he says, pray for the government. And the subdeacon says, on your knees. <laughs> and everybody gets on their knees. And they pray for the government. And after a time of prayer, the subdeacon says, up! <laughs> and the people stand up. And the pastor then leads the collect that prays for the government all together. And the people say, amen. And then, pray for your enemies. On your knees. So, I mean, this time of prayer, back and forth, back and forth. Corporate and individual, all united together. This is what the, and it took time. It took a lot of time, but it's what time was for. And so they didn't mind using it. Um, I did this a few years ago at, at St. Paul. We didn't do the up and down. We don't have kneelers and the pews are tight and people aren't as small as they used to be. And, and so, but, but we still had the time of silence for the individual prayer. I will never forget my daughter, my youngest daughter. She walks out of church and she says to me, Dad, that was really neat. You know, I don't think I've ever prayed in church before. <laughs> and I thought, did she just speak something profoundly true? I know what she meant, but she meant she hadn't spent that time in prayer like she does at home when she's praying for other things in church. Hmm. So Justin's picture there. When we come together, we, we pray, we, we stand up together and make prayers. And then he says, and when we finish the prayers, bread and wine and water, always with the water because that's how they drank it, are brought to the president who offers up prayers and thanksgivings as much as he can. Earlier, um, he had described this prayer as when he takes it, he gives praise and glory to the Father of all in the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and gives thanks at length that he has been considered worthy of such, or that we have been considered worthy of such gifts. The people chime in with their amen. And then to each is given a portion of those things which have been Eucharistized, thanksgiving made over them. Each partakes and a share is brought to the deacons, to those who are absent. So preaching set squarely in the middle of the divine service, after the readings, and before the, sir, before the, the Eucharist. 
If you borrow the liturgy of the Pentecostals, you lose St. Augustine, who said, Verbum acedit ad elementum et fit sacramentum. I don't think he's just talking about speaking the words of institution over the elements. I think he means the word comes first and it comes to the elements, which includes us, <laughs> and it becomes sacrament. And this order is very important. If you look at what the, the liturgy of the Pentecostals has done, which has invaded our church in some piece, in some parts, you see um, communion is done up front and sort of dispensed with. Um, not quite, I, I knew an ELCA church, well, it wasn't ELCA back then, it was LCA, in, in North Carolina, where, because they didn't want to take time for the Lord's Supper, the pastor consecrated the elements and put them on a table in the narthex for the people to pick up on their way out. Seriously! With no sense that he just destroyed the entire sacrament by that way of doing it. But, 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 oh gosh, this leads us even further astray. But stop and think about what that implies. What then is the sole purpose of the sacrament? pure individual, right? The entire corporate nature of this thing happening as the body of Christ and in the body of Christ gets wiped out. This is not a danger that Luther, I mean, in many ways, we as Lutherans need to be particularly aware of that danger because of our strong stress that the sacrament is there to bring comfort to the troubled conscience. My point is it brings trouble to the com to, to, it brings comfort to the troubled conscience inside the context of um, a, 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 of the entire body of Christ being gathered as family. He's come to save you from being an individual. He's come to lift you to the joy of being a person. And a person relates to other persons. It's not about you alone. You want to know what you alone is? That's hell. Check it out. Luke chapter 16. The rich man, all alone in the flames. People always say that nonsense. Oh, if I go to hell, at least I'll have a lot of good company. And it's like utterly not true. You really want to scare the hell out of somebody, you tell them that. Imagine you all alone forever. And isn't that what our every sin demands? Wow. Um, with, with Justin Martyr, we have this picture then of the order and the context. <clears throat> that also means you're part of the same community. If I picked Justin Martyr up and dumped him down in a Lutheran church where the Lutheran liturgy was being followed, would he basically get it? He'd say, oh yeah, I know. There were, there'd be some things that might confuse him. What might confuse him? Individual might confuse St. Paul too. Individual cups. Hey, what? Well, <laughs> and yeah, and the little wafers. And the and they, 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 first of all, they would say, "What did you call that?" <laughs> Listen, that doesn't look like what we would call artos. I don't know. Um, but then that they were individuals, and the individual. And have your choice. Also say, the name One time. say that again. Distribution. John, the body of ah. you, Mary, the body of Yeah. God. Yeah, they, they would not have known, known that. They. I, I, I do think that's something that we probably need to, to revisit. I, I, I asked Kent Burrison to speak about it at, at our. Uh, liturgy conference last time, and I didn't get to actually hear what he said, which I would love to have heard, the, the importance of what we call primary symbols. We always focus on the secondary symbols, but the primary symbol is a loaf and a cup <laughs> and a book. What do you need for church? Water, a bowl of water, 
a cup, a loaf, and a book. Here's the primary symbols, right? And we know that the early church saw big meaning in everybody eating the same loaf and everybody drinking the same cup. So th that would have been different. But basically, Justin Martyr would have seen the same thing that we saw. But then if we're all one body, we have to face the fact that we are not the first to have thought about these words. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about your, uh, Richard, your take on uh, Augustine's uh, The Words mm -hmm. of the Young. That's uh, lovely. Uh, and to get back to what you shared from Augustine, uh, the creature commends to us these beautiful things, or I don't, I don't remember exactly. He, he, he invites us into the pattern of these beautiful things, right. yeah. So it, it occurs to me that the pattern of these beautiful things is not just from the stories of the scriptures, but so he invites us from the scriptures into this pattern of beautiful things. To this beautiful thing, yes. And there is nothing more beautiful than the body and blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of our sins and for the life of the world. Um, if, if we think that we're not the first, though, to preach about this, it invites you not to be arrogant and think you can come to the text like nobody ever has before. You can't. It's a way that's cut off from you. The texts were literally handed to you in a community. And that community happens to have thought about these texts long and hard. And when we come back after lunch, we're going to talk about the way that the community can actually lead your reflection on the text and strengthen your proclamation, particularly at the point where you think the community has got to be crazy to have thought that. Those are the most interesting little moments along the way. We'll pick that up after, after lunch. Thanks.